So Geraint, you've got a new book out. It would be very convenient if you had it right there next to you and could introduce us to the title. I, I do so happen to have a copy. So let's oh, see so beat, beat the Zoom background. So the book is called, Where Did the Universe Come From? Other Cosmic Questions. There we go. It's right. lovely cover. I never understand, there we go. There. Where did the universe it's, come from? Uh, that, you've got to make it think it's part of you. I think that's it, the- it, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yes, um, which is uh, recently published in the US and is now available in bookstores in Australia. Lovely. And your co-author is Chris Ferry. What's what's Chris do with himself? Uh, so Chris is a quantum physicist and mm -hmm. he's based at uh, UTS, University of Technology in Sydney, which is just down the road from the University of Sydney. Mm -hmm. And uh, his research focuses on uh, quantum information and, you know, those routes towards uh, quantum computing, which are going to be here any day now. Right? Any day now. Yeah, we're any all hanging day. out. Yeah. But Excellent. he's all... He's also a, um, a highly successful author. He's written a, a large number of these books, uh, the, the For Baby books. So the first one, I think, was Quantum Mechanics for Babies. And now mm -hmm. there's uh, cryptography and gravity, general relativity, cryptocurrencies, all this stuff. So a, a friend of ours from my wife found it was, was, was very much excited to give a friend of ours as baby uh, statistical physics for yes. babies. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. we'll see how the little eight-month-old is doing with that. Yes, but I should point out that this isn't part of the For Babies series. This is right, a okay. slightly higher level than that. Okay, so you're a cosmologist, as am I. He's a quantum physicist. That's famously the opposite ends of the spectrum. The quantum supposedly is the very small stuff. The cosmologist, the very big stuff. Uh, do you just split the book in half and uh, write a half each, or ha what happens? Well, it is roughly half-half written, but it's not cosmology over there and quantum mechanics over here mm -hmm. so the the goal of the book was to sort of explain that you know modern physics is built on two pillars as they say and we mm -hmm. even got a picture of some pillars in the in the book right uh general relativity on one side which deals with gravity and then quantum mechanics on the other side which deals with the other fundamental forces the mm -hmm. strong force the weak force and electromagnetism and when you go through your undergraduate education, you tend to get presented these two things as quite separate topics, right? Mm -hmm. So I've just finished teaching general relativity and cosmology, and there's no mention of quantum mechanics in there. And when you do in quantum mechanics, there's spin operators and all this kind of stuff and sort of no mention of gravity. But it turns out, of course, is that um, that might be the way that we teach the topic, but when we use these ideas to explain the universe around us is that we need to pull in both parts from relativity and quantum mechanics to come up with something that's workable right so you know if i want to talk about how the universe is evolving and what it looks like etc i can't answer that question without using relativity to describe the large scale of the, the cosmological aspects and quantum mechanics to describe what's going on, on the small scale. They both play important roles. Mm -hmm. And as you already know, there's, there is a, an issue in modern physics, and it's, it's not, we shouldn't even call it an issue of modern physics. It's an issue that's been around for over 100 years. It's about getting these two ideas, these two theories to play nicely together. So quantum mechanics is famous because the language of quantum mechanics is probability and um, particles and forces from, uh, being mediated by particles. And relativity on the other side is a, a classical theory in the sense of it talks about fields and space time, et cetera, and there's no quantization aspect. So how do we get these two things to work together when their mathematical descriptions are very, very different? So just to recap, for quantum mechanics is part of the toolkit of every physicist. So basically, when we tried to understand atoms, you know, matter down on that scale, we found that the the ordinary laws of the world around us, of um, billiard balls and waves on the ocean and all that sort of stuff, if we applied those down at the level of atoms, they failed to describe what's going on down there. In particular, they would lead you to think that atoms themselves were unstable, that electrons would just spiral into the nucleus. So the rules changed from our perspective of course down there they'd always knew what <laughs> the atom always knew what it was doing uh but so on a, on a 
on the language that we use to describe the world down there is very different to the way we describe things up here, as you said, probabilities and, and probability waves and all this sort of stuff. Uh, so the problem is that if we try to think, okay, what's the basic stuff of the world and now I have to describe it in the language of quantum mechanics, if we try to take that approach to gravity under Einstein's uh, idea of gravity, the basic stuff of the world is space and time. And so all of our attempts so far to describe space and time themselves in terms of a quantum language of probabilities and all that sort of stuff have have thus far failed, or at the very least, we don't have one unique solution that we think is the answer to all these things. In light of that, what can you actually say about, what, what can a quantum uh, physicist and a cosmologist like yourself actually talk about in a book? Well, we have to talk about the situations where um, you can't ignore one aspect or the other. Right. So let's just take an example. Um, you know, what we do in the book is we sort of lay out um, a history of the universe, history uh, of the past universe, mm -hmm. the present universe, and the future universe. And we talk about the cosmological aspects, the expanding universe, and all that kind of stuff, and all the things that are going on in the universe. Um, if we take the early universe, right, the uh, universe was hot and dense. This is, you know, the, the hot big bang picture of the early universe. Mm -hmm. And so... The universe was expanding, which means, you know, space was expanding, right? And that was responding to sort of the contents in the universe, right? So whatever was there, that dictated how the universe expanded. Mm -hmm. And that early time, it was dominated by radiation, right? Electromagnetic radiation bounced around. But there were also lots of particles there, so there was mass involved as well. As well as those things just being in the universe, they interacted, Right. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like the radiation was just doing its thing and the particles were doing their thing. They were interacting. And those interactions are quantum mechanical in nature. They, they, that's what they're dictated by. Yeah. And so, you know, you get photons turned into particles, particles turned into photons. And you get to this epoch around, um, you know, from about a second up to a few minutes where we had this this event known as uh, nucleosynthesis, when uh, the elements first elements were formed. So the universe had cooled down to a point whereby things could join together. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to describe that, right, I need to know a few things, right? I need to know what the interactions are. So I can get that from my nuclear physics textbook, right? My nuclear physics textbooks tell me how often two protons will join together at a certain temperature, etc. There's these uh, numbers that we, you know, call cross sections that tell you about how particles. Yeah, hang on, I've got a... There's one foundations of. <laughs> well, we're promoting books. Yes. Yeah, it's quite a big and and hairy looking thing. I haven't quite worked my way through it, but yes. yes. So, so a, a good astrophysicist does need to know this stuff and cosmologist. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you think, all right. So I know all the interactions. So therefore, I can calculate. You know what's the result of nuclear synthesis going to be mm -hmm. but there's an important element that comes into play right so there's the density of material and the temperature mm -hmm. and that is related to the way that the universe is expanding but mm -hmm. the way the universe is expanding is related to the contents of the universe so they're sort of implicitly linked mm -hmm. you have to solve both at the same time so the universe will expand in a certain way it will cool in a certain way and that will dictate the rate at which nuclear reactions occur so you can't separate the two. You can't talk about the early universe and the outcomes of the early universe without putting both pieces together. Yeah, and we can do that because at that point in the universe, we can sort of treat quantum mechanics and the expansion of the universe to a degree. We at least can understand those two pieces and then combine the pieces. We don't have to do the, the quantum gravity thing at that point because the thing that's quantum at that point it's the stuff in the universe yes it's not the space and time themselves which we think get all quantum and, and bumpy and lumpy and weird yeah yeah that's precisely it so we we're in a regime where they can work together uh in the sense that you can what's the right way of putting this sticky tape the two <laughs> yeah. together right I mean, what we're saying is, is that you know, many people think that, as you said, space is really quantized, 
Mm. But at this epoch of the universe, we don't have to worry about that quantization for the interactions that are going on in the universe. So gravity is playing its role as it's basically shepherding the universe mm -hmm. uh, and quantum mechanics is doing it, but it's not like we need quantum gravity or whatever the theory of everything is gonna to be to solve that. So it's, it's a little bit like the air in this room. We know it's made of individual atoms, but I can treat it on a large enough scale as if it's just a smooth continuum. Yeah. Um, so at that point in the early universe, we can treat space as something nice and smooth. At what point do we have to start worrying that that's not the right answer? Well, if there are several places uh, in the history of the universe that we need to, to worry about not having a quantum theory of gravity or theory of everything, right? Mm. Uh, and the two main ones, the ones that cause the most pain are you know, the very birth of the universe. Where did the universe come from? Mm -hmm. So in those initial stages of the universe, it was exceedingly dense. Uh, so there was really strong gravity, gravitational fields or gravitational interactions, but then there were also strong, strong force, weak force and, and electromagnetism. And there's this idea that they might all be bundled into one super force, mm. right? And if that's the case, we just do not have the mathematics to describe that. And yeah. there's, you know, there's some people who want to quantize gravity. There's other people who are saying that actually quantum mechanics needs to be pulled more into the the gravitational side of the picture, et cetera. Other people say, no, we need to go off on a completely different tangent again. And so we don't know. And we, we haven't known, um, you know, since Einstein came up with the general theory of relativity more than a hundred years ago, but how we could relate all of these forces together. People have been trying ever since. Right, so that's the past, plenty of questions there. You also talk about the present uh, of the universe. Yes, so there's lots of things in the universe where we combine quantum mechanics and gravity. Uh, and again, we, we think we can do it because the quantum aspect of gravity doesn't play a role. Let's take a star, mm -hmm. right? So a star is a big ball of gas and it's a, uh, a big ball of gas is gonna have to have gravity, right? So there will be gravitational attractions involved. So if you have a big ball of gas, gravity is squeezing that ball of gas and the center is heating up and the densities are getting higher. And that's mm -hmm. when you start to pack particles very close together. And when particles get very close together, then you get these quantum mechanical interactions. You again get, you know, two little hydrogen atoms coming close together. They get close enough that the strong force can, can play its part. So if, if I want to describe a star, if you, do you have a stellar textbook behind you? Just oh, I must. Uh, um, oh, no, I've got the interstellar medium. Got a galaxy formation. Oh, I don't. There you go. Okay. The cosmology one. They're all at the office. All right. So if you, if you wanted to describe a star mathematically, right, you have to put in the two ingredients again, right? You have to put in gravity to describe the squeezing, et cetera. And you have to put in quantum mechanics to describe the reactions and the energy that's released that then flows outwards yep. and supports the star. So again, it's similar to the early universe is that you can put these two things together, but it's not just the, the burning of a star over its lifetime, right? It's the formation of stars, mm. the evolution of stars to the deaths of stars where we combine gravity and quantum mechanics. So like in our universe, a, a massive star ends its life. The radiation pressure, which is supporting the star disappears. Star collapses, so gravity wins, but it forces material to really high densities and temperatures. So quantum mechanics kicks in again. Mm -hmm. Boom, star blows itself apart as a huge amount of energy is released. So each stage of, of the life of a star from, from as Laurel and Hardy say, from soup to nuts, right? From, 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 <laughs> nice. woe, from woe to go, um, <laughs> is, is dictated by gravity and quantum mechanics. But they are two separate toolboxes that you're bringing along. You yeah. can't describe a star with just one of them. You need yeah. both. So there's a nice, I think we've done this previously in, a, in one of our videos, I'll link it above. So there's a good question you can always ask in astrophysics, which is what's fighting gravity? If gravity wins, black hole. If it's not a black hole, something else is at play. And it might be as simple as motion. You know, 
why is it the sun, why isn't the earth being pulled into the sun? Just so it's moving around in its orbit. But there's always that question of what else is there that in, in, that, that's fighting back against gravity? Uh, and, and of course we have that. I mean, this is one of the things when uh, you do, you teach first year physics and you do classical mechanics and you, hmm. you, you ask students, you know, why aren't we falling towards the center of the earth? What is the force responsible for keeping us away from the center of the earth? And of course that, you know, that electromagnetism, but then you run into all the other issues and you run into quantum mechanics again, very, very quickly, right? Hmm. Cause you deal with atoms and atomic structure and you're into the language of quantum mechanics. Yeah. Uh, and finally, you look into the future of the universe, a famous uh, famous topic of yours that you enjoy. Well, I think we've done a video about that as well. So yes. what, is the, what does quantum mechanics have to say about all of that? Well, of course, what, what we have is that when we get into the very distant universe, right, it's going to become like a, a, an empty, very thin soup of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But it, to get there, it's going to go through some stages, right? So we know that, you know, hundred trillion years, the last star will die. So the, the stars die and the radiation that's pushing outwards disappears, but most stars won't collapse into a black hole. Mm -hmm. And as you said, there has to be something to stop them. Yep. And of course, this is this notion of degeneracy pressure, which we spoke about recently, is that if you try and pack particles in too tightly, you know, in, in a Newtonian picture, there's nothing to stop you, right? Eventually you can squeeze things as close as you like. Yeah. But quantum mechanics says, uh, oh, there's a certain density of neutrons that you can have, right? And you can pack them to be out. And you have to go above a certain limit before that packing breaks down. And then gravity will win and that thing will completely collapse. So, so, so yeah, for most things, they don't like being squashed. And for reasons that are really hard to understand, even mathematically, but especially just in words, certain quantum things called fermions really, really don't like being squashed. And that's as best as I've <laughs> discovered of how to explain that. I mean, I, 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 when we last spoke about this, right, it, you could do it mathematically. I think the, the hard part is that you've got to stop thinking about two particles as being two separate particles, because in mm. quantum mechanics, they become one entangled system. Yeah. Right. And the question is, was what can that entangled system look like? And in fermions, it says that you just can't put two of them in the same place or three of them in the same place or four of them in the same place. There's, so it's just stopped from. So you can't ever write out a mathematical solution for electrons in the same place. Now, how electrons know that that's a, a different topic altogether. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, well, that's the major question that we've asked from. I mean, people ask that about Newton's theory. How, do, how does every particle in the universe, mass, mass in the universe, know where everything else in the universe is? It's, it's a dangerous question to ask. Yeah. But looking even, you must look even further into the future, the, the rules of matter. If there's anything matter is capable of doing, give it enough time and it'll, it'll do it. What, what, uh, what's uh, yeah. in store? Well, of course, the, there's a big question about whether or not uh, the, the particles that we have in the universe, are they stable? Hmm. Right now, so of course we have uh, the proton. That's a special member of this class of particles called baryons. Mm -hmm. It's the lightest baryon. So if there's decays, you end up with protons. And the question is, are protons stable? And at the moment, we don't know. Uh, they might have a lifespan of over ten to the forty years. That's mm -hmm. it. That's what our experiments are telling us. But we don't know. But if they aren't stable that tells you that there are forces in the universe or processes, that, you know, however you want to word it, that we have yet to discover, right? So we talk about the, the four um, fundamental forces, mm -hmm. but in reality, if protons do decay, there will be other interactions that will only become apparent on these immense timescales. And then there's, a, there's bigger questions. Are, are electrons stable? We, I don't go into this in the book, but this is something that just keeps me awake at night. Is, <laughs> right? Is, 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 yeah. On these immense timescales, do even things like electrons break down? At the moment, there's no sign of that happening, that there's, there's no interaction that would mean electrons decay because there's nothing smaller. Well, the neutrinos, et cetera. But you know, there are conservation laws which seem to prevent that. Um, but yeah, 
uh, as yet, you might get that in the distant universe, matter melts. But in, in the very, very distant universe, of course, then you've still got this issue that after all of that, black holes will probably still exist. Mm. But you have to worry about quantum mechanics and the lifespan of black holes, right? So there's this thing called Hawking radiation, mm -hmm. which is a quantum, quantum mechanical effect at the event horizon of a black hole, which basically robs the black hole of energy. I think that book's behind me as well. <laughs> yeah, carry on. Robs the black hole of the energy. And um, so essentially that means that black holes will eventually evaporate away. But the, the, um, the energy loss through Hawking radiation is so feeble mm. that it's going to be timescales of 10 to the 100 years for the largest black holes we know to get to that point where they're going to evaporate away most of their mass. Yeah, so this all reminds me of, there was, I think it turned out not to be true, but they looked at, this, this is going to sound like it's irrelevant, but they sort of looked at glass in very old buildings, like old churches or cathedrals or something, and it seemed to be a bit thicker at the bottom. And so I thought, oh, hang on a minute, on thousand year timescales, maybe glass is actually a liquid, and it's very, very slowly just settling down over a thousand year time scale. I think it turned out to be actually part of the, the the production process. But the question of what you would see, it's a bit like us watching slow motion videos uh, where suddenly the world looks like an extraordinarily different place. Well, uh, maybe a fast motion video, you know, if you had, you know, a, a consciousness where a thousand years went by in a in a in a click maybe maybe to you glass is just a liquid i don't think it actually is but that that's a useful example is we think of you know protons as being stable well maybe if uh 10 to the 30 years went by for you in a in an instant as whatever consciousness you were protons wouldn't be stable you wouldn't think of them you'd think of them as basically being radioactive you know those short-lived yeah. protons that just hang around for a moment and then blip away Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, it, I mean, we, we, we know about this on Earth. It, it still does my head in a little bit that the, the, the mantle underneath the, 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 the crust of the Earth is a solid, right? It's mm. not liquid, right? It's, the core is liquid. But on the time scale of hundreds of millions of years, it flows, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, yeah, and so, yeah. so you know, if you, if you could watch the Earth over several billion years, you'd see the continents all floating around as if they really are rafts on a liquid. Yeah. But the, you know, if you dig down, you will find a solid. You, know, you don't find liquid until you go yeah. a long way down. I did, it's one of my, I've got to find it. Uh, someone being funny posted uh, on, on Amazon for sale, just a sample of uranium 238. And someone else being even funnier in the comments put, I ordered this four and a half billion years ago and when it arrived, half of it was gone. <laughs> ah, so so that, I think that is a follower from a joke that was published a couple of days earlier that somebody Possibly. had ordered um, a, a, a sample of gold 199 <laughs> and it took three days to arrive and there's only half of it left. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the things we think of as solid ground and solid matter and all of that sort of stuff. So... Well, uh, what, what else? Well, what else is in the book? Well, I, we, we sort of finish off by saying that while cosmology has been a great success, right? I mean, our understanding of the universe is a great success. There is this gaping hole because of this difference between quantum mechanics and, and relativity that we don't know where the universe came, came from. Uh, we don't know what's going on in the middle of black holes and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so there are still things to be solved. And so, you know, it's, it's a, a call to arms, right? I mean, we need, we need smart people to be coming into to physics and think that this is a, an important task to do, right? Yeah. There's, there's already enough lawyers and doctors out there. Doctors are great, <laughs> right? That, but, Actually, but, I don't know, think there are enough doctors, but carry on. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, okay. Lawyers, so, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, smart people going in to try and solve some of these big problems, I think... Uh, I, I, I do wonder, is it something I'm going to see solved in my lifetime? Mm. Uh, because you know, right, is that it just takes one smart person to get wake up one morning and just go, oh. And then, you know, you've opened up a new door that's going to be science for the next 500 years. Yeah. But, you know, at the moment, we've been stuck for essentially a century and getting stuckerer. Stuckerer. Yeah. Well, 
<laughs> on that beautiful word. Uh, yeah, so the book is Where Did the Universe Come From? And Other Cosmic Questions. Yeah, very nice. Uh, Chris Ferry, I, was, I say, I, I read it, you sent, sent it to me to sort of proofread and it was, it was all very enjoyable to read. I quite enjoyed it, so I liked it a lot. Um, so yeah, available wherever all good books are sold, I assume. When's it, sorry, when's it out in Australia? It, 1st of November, it appears on the shelves, but of course it's available at all good and some disreputable um, online bookstores. So if you don't find it where you buy books, go in and demand it from the front uh, counter. Absolutely.